Good morning, everyone. My name is Enrique Hardigi. I'm the SLO coordinator for Fresno City College, located in the Central Valley of California. Um, at this time, at this time, I'd like to invite you to uh, introduce yourself in the chat and tell us how the weather is, where you're from, and uh, what you what is your position. Um, well, uh, with this time, I'd like to welcome uh, all the higher education professionals to our Friday SLO talk a weekly Zoom event dedicated to enhancing student learning outcomes. We encourage you to participate by asking questions and sharing comments throughout the presentation. Feel free to, to use the chat feature in Zoom or post our pallet site. If you prefer to speak directly, please raise your hand and wait for a natural pause in the conversation to contribute. We're also pleased to welcome our coaches today in a moment, they will be introduced themselves and share their insights with us. Remember that Friday as well talks are open and free for everyone, and all related resources can be found on the coaches' website. Thank you for joining us, and we look forward to a productive session. At this time, I'd like to have the coaches introduce themselves, and then uh, Danny will be doing the um, uh, speaker introduction. Yarek, would you like to introduce yourself? Certainly. Good morning, everyone. My name is Yarek Yanyo. I'm the founder of the Friday SLO Talks, and I'm a faculty coordinator at Santa Ana College School of Continuing Education. Welcome to today's webinar. Danny. Thank you, Yarek. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Danny Pittaway. I'm a full-time faculty member at Coastline College, which is in Orange County, California. I serve there as the student success coordinator and also the SLO coordinator. And so I have the distinct privilege of introducing our speaker this morning. So this morning, uh, we have the privilege of hearing from Dr. Susan A. Ambrose, a luminary in the field of education with an illustrious career spanning over three decades. Dr. Ambrose retired after dedicating 30 years to Carnegie Mellon University, where she served as Associate Provost for Education, Director of the Eberly Center for Teaching and Learning, and Teacher Professor in the Department of History. She concluded her distinguished career with eight impactful years at Northeastern University, holding the positions of Senior Vice Chancellor for Educational Innovation and Professor of Education and History. In today's presentation, Dr. Ambrose will delve into the intricacies of how learning functions with the goal of guiding us in designing and implementing educational courses and experiences that not only resonate deeply, but also have a lasting impact on our students. She will explore the critical connection between learning, student outcomes, and assessment, highlighting how these elements are pivotal in enhancing the educational process. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Susan A. Ambrose to this Friday SLO talk. Well, thank you very much, Danny. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. I am um, north of Chicago by about 30 miles. Um, and so it's a beautiful and sunshiny day here although it could be snow and below zero tomorrow. So we're just enjoying the sunshine today. Um, I'm really happy to be here and, and talk to you. I have been retired for almost three years and, um, and it's been great. Hence my, my first slide there saying happily retired. Um, I knew when it was time to go. I always thought I'd be working, teaching, administering until I was in my 70s. And, um, and I loved it. I loved every single day of it. And I went out on top loving what I did. Um, and so I'm really happy to, to be back to talking about learning. I, I haven't done much speaking in the few years I've been retired. Again, I thought I would be out continuing my consulting and my speaking, but um, I've I've learned I'm learning how to be retired and finding all kind of interesting and new things to learn. And it is true that learning continues. So I'm happy to be talking about learning today. Um, I became interested in learning. 40 years ago as a graduate student when I taught my first course, uh, Carnegie Mellon, which is where I got my degree. If you were in computer science or engineering getting a doctorate, you didn't have to teach. But if you were in the humanities, you needed to teach. Um, and I embraced it and I loved it. 
But I remember in my very first course that I designed and started to teach, I was very disappointed in a lot of the interactions in some of the students' attitudes and many of the misconceptions they held. And when I talked to some of my professors who were amazing there, um, they couldn't really help very much. They had often had similar issues with students, lack of comprehension or understanding and, and uh, lack of motivation. And they gave me some strategies they used, which sometimes worked for me and sometimes didn't. And so it was at a graduate as a graduate student that I really became interested in how learning works. Um, my, my mentor in the history department suggested that I saunter over to the psychology department where we had a very distinguished faculty of cognitive psychology. And so I started reading and talking and working with some of those folks to really try and understand learning at a very deep level. Um, when I finished Carnegie Mellon, I stayed on. And so I really called through many, many, many decades of research along with some of my cognitive psychology mentors and started talking about six of these seven principles um, way back in 1990, 92. So before we were talking a lot about the underlying mechanisms of learning. And so it culminated in, um, in the book um, of which I'm going to talk about, oh, all of a sudden, We, we tested in advance, there we go, um, in the book that I'm going to talk about. Now, I'm not probably going to get to all seven principles because a lot of good teachers know that sometimes less is more to make sure that learners, especially if they're new to a, an area, a domain, a concept, can really take the time to process it. So what I'm going to do is just briefly set the context for learner-centered teaching and then talk about a couple of the principles. If we get to all seven, great, but what I'm hoping is that there will be lots of opportunity for questions and comments and concerns and also examples of the principle in action. I have talked about these principles for many, many years across many institutional types in many countries around the world from Latin America through Europe and Asia. Um, and what I have always found to be true is that faculty often are um, using strategies that work in particular instances or context. And when they hear the principles, they finally understand why the strategy worked in one context and not another. Um, and so I really would like you, if you're connecting to one of the principles I'm talking about and you have an example of how you use the principle as you design the course or learning experiences to share that either in the chat or um, in any other way when we have a time. My objective or my outcome for the end of the session is that hopefully you can walk away and be able to describe at least one of the principles to a colleague who hasn't attended and explain how either you're already using the principle or you plan to use the principle in a course you teach. So I want you to understand the principle, but more importantly, to have a, a strategy or two that you can use. So I want it to be very um practical. So the context. So these learn these principles are grounded in the research literature. Um, and I've worked with these as have my colleagues and co-authors in the book for many years with faculty. They're broadly applicable across domains, students, levels, ages, context. Um, and as I said, they've resonated with faculty and teachers um, across the world. The most important part of this to me is that these principles are generative. As I said about strategies, when you're given a strategy to, to implement toward a challenge, um, that strategy may work in a particular case or context or with a particular group of students, but may not work in another context at a different area um, of time in student development in a different type of course. And so 
the the idea of underla understanding how learning works and then from these principles generating or identifying which strategy to use is to me what's most important. And that's what helped me in my career as a teacher. Why a learning centered approach? Well, we know from a lot of research that learning results from what the student does and thinks and only from what the student does and thinks. That our role as teachers is to advance learning by influencing what the student does to learn. And so, as I always tell my students when I showed them this quote, the onus of learning is really on them. The degree to which we as faculty and teachers can impact learning is by the environment that we create, the kind of course and learning experiences and assessments that we design that's gonna get students to engage in the behaviors that are going to enhance learning. And so that's what I wanna talk about, these principles that will lead to student engagement in behaviors that will allow them to um, be successful in meeting what it is we've set out for them to do in our courses um, and, and other learning experiences. I want to just quickly say that for me, when I think about learning, learning is the ability to use information and skills fluently and flexibly in new contexts. And I'm going to come back to that several times as I talk about the different principles. So when we focus on the learner, when we come into the design of a learning experience or a course, not with what do I want to teach them, but what do I want my students to learn? Subtle, it's subtle, but in some respects, it's really huge. We think about the learner very broadly as, as the intellectual, social, emotional beings that they are. And we will come to understand that Everything that the learner comes into our classrooms, our studios, our labs with will influence how they take in information, how they see it, how they retrieve it, how they organize it, how they put it together in new and different ways, and eventually, hopefully, how they're able to use it fluently and flexibly in a variety of contexts, both while they're at colleges or universities with us and when they get out into the world. And so um, focusing on what it is we want learners to be able to do with the background knowledge of who learners are broadly constructed is what's really important here. As I said, going from how we teach to how students learn is huge. And I've seen for many years when the big outcomes um, movement happened and, and, and we were asking uh, departments to have departmental outcomes or program outcomes and faculty to have outcomes or objectives in their courses. There was a lot of pushback um, initially, and I understand from some of my administrator friends that often there's still pushback around both outcomes and assessment. But what I want to say is that when you are outcomes focused or objectives focused, whether at a program level or a course level or even a unit level, that to me says that you have been able to move from what it is I want to teach to what it is I want students to learn. And so I think that outcomes and assessments are really, really important in helping us with that shift. So. These are the seven principles at a glance. We're not going to get to all of them today because I don't want to rush them. And Yarek and I discussed, I or one of my co-authors can always come back and, and, um, and address the principles that we didn't address because in this case, truly um, less is more. And so these principles all work together there is not one that is more important than the other. Than the other. They could have been organized in a different way. Um, this tells a particular story. So what I wanna do um, initially is begin with prior knowledge and organization. And then I wanna stop and entertain comments, questions, examples, um, experiences that you've had. 
And then we'll move on to motivation and mastery. Um, and then I want to stop and do the same thing. If we have time to get to the others, we will. But again, please don't worry. You're not going to get an incomplete picture because at some point, I or one of my co-authors can come back and, um, and um, address the others. So prior knowledge. Um, prior knowledge, think about it as the lens through which you take in new information. So we all come to every learning experience with this lens that has been developed based on prior experience, academic experience or experience out in the world. When what we bring into our learning experience, our classroom is activated, sufficient, appropriate and, action, and accurate, great things happen. We have a solid foundation on which to build. That's the good news. The bad news is that sometimes our learners come into our classrooms, our labs, our studios with prior knowledge that is inactive or insufficient or inappropriate or inaccurate. Um, I wanna very briefly tell you what those things um, refer to. I'm not gonna go into too much depth, but um, I think it's important that we understand that not all prior knowledge is sort of equal. There are different levels of prior knowledge. So um, the, the one that most faculty can most easily identify is inaccurate. We know when our students come in and as Will Rogers said in my next slide, let's get there. Oh, let me go back. It's not what we don't know that gives us trouble, it's what we know that ain't so. So in other words, inaccurate knowledge is pretty easy to identify on the part of most faculty. And it's what we um, deal with most frequently because it's easy to see and it's easy to grasp. If students simply do not or misunderstand a concept, um, it's, it's usually pretty easy for us to identify that. What's not as um, easy for us to see is, or to understand, is the inactive, insufficient, and inappropriate knowledge. Inactive knowledge is knowledge that the students have. They have been exposed to it, but it has not been activated. Um, so, for example, a lot of my friends very early on in disciplines like architecture and engineering would be very, very frustrated when their students would have taken physics and then come into their engineering and architecture or architecture course and appear to not have learned anything in physics. And this would always perplex my colleagues in those disciplines. Well, in fact, it wasn't unusual that students had learned within the context of physics a lot of the things that they needed. But when they got into architecture or engineering, that knowledge was not activated. And it was not activated in some respects because they didn't know they were going to be using it. And it may not have been activated because when they learned it, the context was never the problems the examples were never within those fields of engineering and or architecture. And so the knowledge is, was there, it just wasn't activated. And that leads to the question of how do you activate that inactive knowledge? Sometimes it's something as easy as saying to students, I know that you learned this in your physics class, or I know that you learned this in your calculus class, or I know, in other disciplines, I know that you learn this in your you know, intro to anthropology class or in your intro to public policy class. It's simply reminding students that it's there and they need to, to pull it out of their longer term memory. So that's one way to activate it. Another way is before students even step into the first class, providing them with a list of concepts that you assume they learned in a previous course. And so students can glance down those concepts and A, it activates it. It lets their brain say, aha, I'm gonna be using this. And B, if they recognize the concept, but they don't know 
uh, or remember exactly what it is, they have an opportunity to go back and and uh, refresh their memory. This happened in a lot of, I know, MBA programs. Before people come into an MBA program, they're often sent a list of um, things that they should already know. And they're often told, if you don't know these, you better learn them because we're not going to review them. We're going to build on them. So that's inactive knowledge. It's there. It's accurate. It's just not activated. And then there's insufficient knowledge. I always find this one really interesting. Insufficient knowledge is you have a piece of the knowledge, but not the, the full um, realm. And, and here's the best way to explain that. You know, we know there are different levels of understanding. There's recognition. So I can look at that and, 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 and identify what it is. They're sort of definition. I can define for you that algorithm or I can describe it, that a concept, a principle. Then there's the, I know how to execute it. I can do more than recognize and define. I can actually use it. And then the highest level is I know when to use it. And that's really key because if you know something but you know when you don't know when to actually implement it, that becomes a problem. And so we, many of us, I think, grew up in this sort of era where one of our teachers may say to us, how many of you know Ohm's law, Kirchhoff's law? And students would put up their hand. And what we meant by no, without ever articulating it is, you know what it is, you know how to use it, and you know when to use it. Sometimes what students meant by no is, I recognize it. I, I remember hearing about it, or I can even define it or define and use it, but I don't know when. So there are different levels of knowledge. And so the insufficient knowledge is really key to um, us understanding what it is students know so that we can build on it. I, I will very quickly say that many, many years ago, um, we devised a, a, a little questionnaire that we would either hand out to students or use in a show of hands in which instead of saying, how many of you know this, we would actually say, how many of you recognize this concept or principle or, or whatever? How many of you could define it? How many of you could define it and use it? How many of you know when to use it? And it turns out that if you ask students at those different levels, guess what? They really are able to self-assess their level of understanding. And so that's a very easy way before a course begins or in the midst of a course to kind of quickly gauge where students are in terms of insufficient knowledge. And then there's inappropriate knowledge. Inappropriate knowledge is accurate. It's simply used in the wrong place and or time. And so inappropriate knowledge I think is a little easier to identify than inactive and insufficient. Um, maybe not as um, easy to identify as inaccurate, but it's kind of in the middle. So it's students using a particular statistical test in the wrong con context. And so, you know, they pulled one out and it worked when I did a problem that looked like this. So I'll try it again. And it was appropriate in one problem case, but not in the other. So that's prior knowledge. It's everything that you bring into the course that is the lens through which you take information in to process it. And if it's a stable base of prior knowledge, if it's activated, sufficient, appropriate, and accurate, it's much easier for us to build on. If not, we really have to think about, A, how do we identify it? And then B, what do we do about it? How do we help students to get to where they need to get? Because if we just plow ahead, then the amount and level of depth of learning that happens is going to be compromised. Now, I, I connect this when I talk about prior knowledge with organization, because it's not enough to just have a body of knowledge that may be accurate and sufficient and, and appropriate and activated, but if it's not organized in a way that our students can retrieve it 
and use it fluently and flexibly in different or new context, then that knowledge doesn't serve them very well. And what we know from expert novice studies is that experts really walk around sometimes, oftentimes, without even realizing that we have very rich, meaningful knowledge structures in our heads that really support our expertise. It's in part why we're experts. Think about them as pictures. You may have heard of them as schemas, as mental models. Whatever they are, they're an organization of information that allows us when we're learning new things to connect to. And when we are able to make those connections, then we're more easily able to retrieve that information on cue when we need it. And the difference between experts and novices organization of knowledge is huge because novices, unless we really spend time helping students to understand how to organize, typically have sparse superficial knowledge structures. Now, as students move from novice to, toward expertise, depending on what level you're teaching, um, they do continue to develop organization of knowledge. Our organizations are always, always changing along with the new information that we're taking in. Um, but it's very difficult for students to be successful, again, if they can't retrieve the knowledge. And if we don't know what kinds of organizational structures they have, then it's really difficult for us to kind of impact that. So here are, um, here are four examples from, I see that the attribute fell off from a, a colleague of mine, Fred Reif, who was a physicist and a physics educator at, at Carnegie Mellon. And, and I really like these because they give you a snapshot of knowledge organization. Um, so if you look at A, I think about this in terms of, um, say, su say uh, if you're teaching an intro science course where you have uh, a lecture once a week, a recitation once a week, and a lab once a week. Think about it that way. Or maybe what you're doing is you're teaching a Monday, Wednesday, Friday class. So it's, you know, my history class, but it meets Monday, Wednesday, Friday. This first organizational structure, as you see, is that everything is segmented. Well, here's what happened on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And even though as I was teaching it, I was expecting they were making connections. Those all go together in some way. The students weren't making connections or they don't see what happened in lecture as connecting to what's happened in lab or recitation. And so those are disjointed pieces of knowledge and they aren't an organizational structure that's gonna allow students um, to retrieve that information as they move out into the world. Um, B is an organizational structure which is very linear. And so uh, this really, I found this to be true um, as I, I was teaching my history courses. Students think of history as very linear. So something happened before something else and then something happened after that something and it's very linear. And when I, I used to teach my freshman seminars on immigration, students had a very difficult time um, when we talked about immigration, urbanization, and industrialization. And I would always draw, draw this on the board as three overlapping um, phenomena that was taking place at the same time and interacting with each other. And yet when I would ask students to do their first picture, kind of concept map of what they were learning a few weeks into the course, Inevitably, despite the fact that I drew the picture with three overlapping um, circles, students would inevitably come up with something like this or a kind of stepped, you know, first immigration happened and then industrialization and then urbanization or, you know, in any order. And so they had a very simplistic and inaccurate organizational structure that was not going to serve them well in the course. And I needed to help them identify their organizational structure so that as they move through the course, they could start connecting things where they went. 
C is a common organizational structure, say in a you know in a science course, um, and D is a more common um, organizational structure, say in a history course, anthropology, sociology course, where um, where it's not as neat and clean as as C. So those. Um, those organizational structures are incredibly important and we can't help students if we can't see those structures. And that's part of the reason why many, many years ago, concept maps became increasingly um, important and used in a lot of courses. Because if you ask students to create some kind of, a, again, concept map, mental model, or just picture of what it is they're learning, you're going to see their thinking and you're able to impact their thinking, how they're organizing information, if you can see it and if you can get them to see it. Um, so let me give one example from my own experience and then let's open it up to comments or questions or examples um, from either of the principals. But I would often start my course asking students to draw a picture of what it is they already knew. And inevitably, they would throw out a lot of facts on a piece of paper and try to connect them. And then a few weeks into the course, maybe a month, I would, I would collect those. I would ask them to do it again. And now it wasn't just a bunch of facts. There were less things on the paper and maybe they've identified a couple of kind of overarching concepts or principles. So they were moving in the right direction. Another month into the course, collect those, another month into the course, I asked them to do it again. And by now their organi stru organizational structure would inevitably be a little more refined and then in the end of the course, I would do it one more time. And then I would give them all four back and ask them to write something very briefly about how their thinking has changed and what they're walking away from the course with. And in my immigration course, if they walked away with those three overlapping circles, I was incredibly happy because they understood the interaction of the three and then whatever they learn about read about as they move out into other courses or into the world they have that picture or that foundational structure on which to work so i'm going to stop right there and rely on my colleagues to let me know whether or not there are questions or comments or examples that people would like to share uh, there was one comment in the Padlet from William. Uh, William, do you want me to read it or did you, just want, did you want to unmute? I don't want to put you on the spot. Sure, go ahead. Uh, okay, um, so William was commenting, I'm curious if or how familiar the authors of this book, I'm assuming meaning your book, um, are with the older book, How People Learn Brain, Mind, Experience, and School. And then he later clarifies, if he's wondering if this research-based book might have been a basis or inspiration or something else from the newer book. Absolutely. Yay. That is one of my favorite books. And that was a book that really did, um, and some articles prior to that book being published that really did um, push our thinking as we push my thinking, and then later on my colleagues thinking as we defined um, the principles. So yeah, absolutely, that's a fabulous book. Thank you, I used the book for quite a few years uh, for my, my own education courses. Uh, Susan, so as, as, as you were speaking, I, I did get a, uh, a message here. And uh, the question really is because, again, you, you, your point is that there are certain skills and competencies with which students exhibit their learning. Historically, we are kind of like conditioned to this. I, I, I think you alluded to this as well. You know, I am already giving my students grades, you know, like, What's up with that? Why why are you questioning this all of a sudden? It's, you know, I have 30 students. I need to teach to the middle of the classroom. 
And now you are throwing in those ideas of, 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 you know, learning, like, how can you tell that I am not teaching and they are not learning if I'm giving them grades? That, that's a really interesting question. I mean, you know, if, if I were the queen of the universe, I would do away with grades. Um, mm. and really focus on assessments that really show both students and us their level of understanding. You know, we all live within the co confines of a semester or a trimester or a quarter or whatever it is we're on. And, um, and you know, it, I, I, I hope we get to um, the, the practice and feedback because the truth is um, a grade doesn't tell us very much. It certainly doesn't tell us the level or degree to which a student has learned. And remember, I'm defining learning as the ability to use something fluently and flexibly in a new context. What right. it tells us is whatever that assessment was at that particular point in time, the students could, um, could meet a certain standard to get an A, a B, or a C. And so, yes, they may have done really well in that physics course and got all A's, but when they got into engineering or architecture, they struggled because they couldn't activate and use those. So did real learning happen there? Um, I, you know, that's the question. A certain level of learning happened. And that's why I say that I don't think grades provide us with the full picture of what it is students know. I'm a huge proponent of giving prior knowledge assessments. Um, and I always found a way to do that in my courses. So look at the syllabi. If you're teaching in a sequential program, for example, look at the syllabi of your colleague. Here's what they were supposed to learn. Take a look at the, the last um, exam that, that they were given or quiz, and then use that as the first one in your course to see if A, they remember or they retained um, the information that they, that they used. Because we are always building on what it is they already know and we're defining no very deeply. So um, I think a lot of the things that I'm suggesting do not take a lot of time and they can be done easily and provide a wealth of information, which really is going to enhance learning. So when we wrote the book and we put a lot of um, time into strategies, we wanted the strategies to be easy, ac accessible, and not um, too onerous in terms of time, because that's one thing that we as faculty never had enough of. Does that sort of get to the question or the Absolutely. comment? Absolutely. I think that's, you know, again, I'm, I, I'm watching the chat here and this is this is very much uh, spot on. With this, the same thought in line, just, just to follow up on this, would you have any comments on, on, on concepts such as uh, mastery grading or outcomes-based education, you know, things that really move away from this testing for the testing sake to assessment of specific skill, competency, observable behavior, what it is that students can actually do at the end of the course. Would that help? Absolutely. And here's what I would argue. I'm a fan of outcomes-based education. I'm a fan of mastery education. And it's what we should have been doing the whole time. How could we as educators for so many years, and look, we're all guilty, okay? How, maybe not all of you out there, but in my, <laughs> in my generation of faculty, we were all guilty of either not having program outcomes in my department or not having outcomes in the syllabus. Or if we had syllabi, it was, here's what I am going to teach you in this course. And shame on us because A, people learn more when they know what it is they're expected to learn. So to say by the end of this course, you should be able to define, use, describe, connect, you know, very specific verbs that re relate to behaviors is what we should have been doing all along. And, you know, we were lucky that, I mean, I was at Carnegie Mellon for many years. We were lucky that we had really smart students and somehow many of them or most of them figured it out. Um, and, and so we all should be in outcomes-based education, because to me, that means you have a set of outcomes, you connect assessments to those outcomes, which actually show the mastery. It shows that they can define something if that's all I need them to do. They can use it flexibly in different contexts, et cetera. 
And so, and mastery is 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 the same kind of in my mind the same con the same concept. In our book, we talk about the different levels of mastery, and it really is knowing at the level of I can recognize or define, I can use, I know when to use, I can use it in a variety of different contexts. That's mastery when I have the ability to use something in a variety of different contexts. Think about masters in your field. Um, if you're a lighting designer or costume designer, if you're a physicist, if you're a historian, think about the masters and think about why they are masters or, or the, the top experts in their field. It's because they have that flexibility and, fluent, and fluency. And so we all should have been doing all along outcomes-based education and mastery. I mean, I, that's what learning is all about. And so those, I mean, those made big splashes in the education world, and I'm glad they did. But in some respects, every time I'd hear it, I would think, you know, shame on us. And, and I, that sounds a little harsh. I don't mean it as harsh because many of us, when we were growing up and becoming faculty, no one was, was opening our eyes to the kinds of things that we're talking about now. So yes, for outcomes-based education and mastery, I think that's what we should all be engaged in. Absolutely. This is just fantastic discussion, Susan. I really appreciate the comments. We can probably move 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 on, but you, you you're you're absolutely right. Some somehow we have at some point maybe maybe there's been some kind of a split between the, you know, apprenticeship back in the Middle Ages. You know, you wanted to uh, uh, build uh, uh, construct something. You had to go to a master who would teach you in the trade versus right. some academic. You know, uh, theoretical. Uh, esoteric you know uh learning so 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 somehow we have those 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 two reality realities seem to be uh, you know colliding in our higher education classrooms and uh, let it, it i i sure hope that competency-based education is going to win because that you're you're absolutely right uh to 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 be a poet you know you you cannot do it without a skill you can't just be born one day wake up you know and and and, and start i mean sure maybe maybe there are people who do that you know, with 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 all kinds of different different uh, genres, different different areas of study, it's just that that's not something that happens overall. Uh, it, it, it's it's not a commonplace. We we should not be uh, hoping that that there is sheer luck that's going to guide our students' success. It needs to be much more purposeful. So right. so thank you for right. those comments. Right. Let me make one more comment and then we can move on. Sure, and sure. That's, that's that something you said just really brought this home to me. Um, I, I would often say that one of the things that gets in the way of our being really good teachers is sometimes our expertise. Right. And expertise gets in the way because the more expert you are, the more you, for example, combine and skip steps when you do whatever it is you're doing. And so when things become such second nature to you, it's very hard to remember the discrete steps, which makes it very hard to look at a novice and sort of outline what it is they need to know. And so the, the best example that I can give of this is we all probably many of us drive. And when you first learn to drive, it's really overwhelming. There are so many things you get in, your seatbelt, adjust the mirrors, you know, you need to know where you're going, you turn on the car, if you have a stick shift, you have two pedals that you're balancing, um, if you need to reverse, there's so much going on, but now we all get in the car and we drive without thinking about any of that. And the reason it sometimes is so difficult to teach our children to drive, and for me it was disastrous, <laughs> is because there are so many little things that we don't think about doing because we've done it for so long. And so if you're an expert in your field, an expertise you know, often defined as 10 years of doing something full-time or 10,000 hours. So the, if you're an expert in your field to remember what it was like to be a novice, that's incredibly difficult. So in some respects, expertise is not our friend when we're trying to create courses in which we have students who are more novice or less expert. Okay, 
why don't we move on? We can always keep using the chat, which I can't see because of the mode I'm in, but, and, and we can always come back and revisit any of these. Um, so this was very good news to me as a very young teacher when I started working with some of our social, social psychologists to understand motivation. Um, I think before this, um, I, I thought motivation was um, just kind of being a, a, a cheerleader in the classroom and being peppy and coming in with a smile on my face and having a lot of energy and sharing the passion that I had for history with my students who happened to be engineers, computer scientists, architects, designers, many of whom had no interest in history whatsoever. So my performance didn't do very much for them. Then I came across all this literature on motivation, which says that the expectation for success and the value that people attribute to what they are about to learn or are learning is what feeds motivation. And if those things are present, it leads to the behaviors that support learning. So for example, if my expectation is that I can learn this, I have confidence, I can learn anything, I'm really smart, then I engage in the behavior so that if I'm teetering, if I'm not quite understanding, what do I do? I join a study group, I do some research on my own, I go and talk to the faculty member. Um, I, I engage in behaviors that is actually going to lead to learning. If I do not have an expectation for success, oh my gosh, physics, I did really poorly in high school physics and I'm, I, I just don't have that mind or, or writing. I'm an awful writer. It's why I went into engineering. I used to hear this from my students all the time. No matter what I do, I'm a terrible writer. If your expectation to be successful and learn whatever it is, um, is low, then it's sort of like, why go to see the faculty member? Why go to the writing center? Why um, join a study group? I just don't have what it takes. So because that expectation is so low, I don't be, I don't engage in the behaviors that's going to lead to learning. Um, that was really powerful for me as a teacher, because we can always help to boost the confidence of students so that their expectation for success can, can swell. Um, one of the ways we can do that is give them very early um, um, opportunities to be successful. So we can, um, we can give them an early assignment. We can give them a quiz. We can talk to them in the hallway or in our office hours, and we can boost their confidence by reminding them or showing them some of those little and early successes because success builds success. Learning um, that you can do something that you never thought you can do builds your confidence. And when your confidence is built, then you have a belief that you can continue to learn. So that's one side of the equation. The other is value. Students, learners need to understand that the value of what they're learning and that value may be um, it's really important to learn your physics or your calculus because you're in engineering and architecture and you're going to need it. Or that value could be, it's really important in your life to understand how laws get made or uh, some of the major public policy issues because you want to be a, a citizen of, of your country. I mean, whatever that value is, if students don't see the value, then they're not motivated again to engage in the behavior that leads to performance. And um, I can remember many a student early on in my teaching career who would say to me, I'm in engineering or I'm in architecture, or I'm in computer science, and I'm never going to use any of this stuff I learned in history. Um, and it wasn't until I helped them understand the way of thinking that guides historians that um, help them to see that, in fact, they may be able to use that in their future courses or in their career. So how do we help students kind of understand the value? Well, sometimes we really have to connect it to the real world. 
So we have to say, you may think this has no value right now, but wait until you get out into the work world and engage in X, Y, and Z. Or you may not see the value now, but let me put this in a context you may understand. One of the biggest breakthroughs very, very early on at CMU is when some of our physics faculty interacted with the engineers and the architects, and they used examples and they had problem sets that were within the context of engineering and um, architecture. So students were using those physics concepts and solving for problems in those domains. It made a huge difference because all of a sudden students realized how important physics was to their future. And as soon as they realized that, they became motivated and engaged in the behaviors that led to success. So for me, the good news about motivation is that it's all about perception. It's students' beliefs in themselves and whether or not they're going to be able to achieve success. And it's their perception of the value um, of a particular task or outcome or goal or you know something that we've given them to do. And the reason I say I thought this was always really good news is that I think that we always have the opportunity to um, impact perception. So as I said, in terms of value, you can always connect what it is you're teaching to the real world, whether it's the real world in terms of the next course you're taking, um, and you simply say to students, you're going to be using this, or whether it's the real world in terms of what happens when you get out into the world. Incidentally, I remember many years ago when I was teaching my history courses telling students that one of the important skills they'll find themselves using in life is um, the ability to be able to look at a piece of information and validate its authenticity. Um, and I remember saying to them, even back then, you're going to come across things that you read or that people tell you that are simply not true. And if you don't have the ability to know where to go to validate that information, you could be in trouble. I think about that all the time. I mean, that was a, one of the objectives in my course always. And I think about that with all of what's going on with fake news and all of the social media feeds, how important that skill is. Um, so connecting to the real world is really important. The other thing that can help students in terms of both um, value and expectation is if you can connect what it is students are doing to something that interests them. And so um, if early on in a course you have a, a small enough group of people that you can get a sense of what their interests are, then you can always find ways to connect to those interests as you're having conversation or dialogue with students. So again, I think that what's really beautiful about this is that if we can help them to believe in themselves, um, and see the value of what it is we're helping them to learn, then they really will engage in those behaviors. Um, I will say this, uh, I always use this as an example. I have two sons and early on the oldest son, I think like many uh, first children, the oldest son just thought he could do everything. He still thinks he can do everything. All you need to do is pick up a couple books, this day, this day and age, get on the internet, find good information, um, do your research and um, and find somebody who can help you and practice and get feedback and 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 then you will learn. And my youngest thought he could do anything and everything. So if he came um, to a stumbling block, he would do just that. He would go to the library at the time there wasn't the internet. Go to the library, find a librarian, do some research, go to his teachers, find somebody in the class who understood. In other words, he engaged in those behaviors that led to learning and performance. My younger son had this older brother who could do anything. And so he was always looking at himself in, in that context. And so he would start, you know, a school year saying, I'm not going to do a really very good in math because Josh is so good in math, or I'm not going to be a really good writer because he's such a really good writer. And I watched him not engage in those behaviors despite trying to push him. Sort of, it was, he sort of gave up. I'll do the bare minimum because I'm never going to be good in math or writing. Um, and because he didn't engage in those behaviors, 
um, he didn't have that that kind of success until you know later on in his life. So, um, and that's a case where, <laughs> despite my trying to um, help him uh, gain confidence and see value, um, which his teachers weren't doing, you know, he didn't get as much out of some of that school experience as he could have. I'm going to stop there if you want to talk about motivation, because I think this is incredibly important, particularly in this day and age when higher education is expensive, when people are worrying about students coming out with debt, um, and when sometimes we may be teaching in programs where we have not been really good about um, the outcomes and how they are gonna concretely help students both be successful in their careers and their lives. And so, um, you know, I just think particularly the issue of value is incredibly important. Are there comments or questions around that? I, I had a, a, it's a question slash a comment. So uh, we're battling as is most campuses, our, our math faculty with a lot of the new legislature or the new legislator that is coming out. And I, I forget the citation, maybe 715. Anyway, it's 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 putting students in transfer level, level math, which which is not the, the point I'm trying to make, but rather the motivation piece when students are feeling overwhelmed with such a tough subject as math already and coming in feeling unprepared. Mm -hmm. I'm an instructional designer on my campus. So I, I'm, I'm trying to take what you're saying, which is fantastic and think, okay, how can I support my math faculty who are feeling this very intense burden to make sure their students don't come in feeling this overwhelmed as soon as they hit the first math test and understand they're not prepared, how do they continue to motivate them? How do they continue to support them? Because we do know that's such an important part of the conversation. Yeah. That's a loaded question. And I'm sorry for putting so much well, on there. No, no, but I, I think you're, it. no, you're right. I think a lot of people are battling that. And, um, you know, because there's been so much research around math, it, you know, math education, um, it, but it transfers to a lot of other subjects. This notion of feeling overwhelmed, especially when you recognize you're under underprepared as a student. Um, and I, I'm always careful about how I say what I'm going to say next, um, because I have great respect for people who teach in secondary education and the constraints they're under and the difficulty of teaching, you know, uh, anywhere from K through 12. Um, but I think it's okay to, um, to say to students, you may be feeling overwhelmed because you're not as prepared as you should be, but lack of preparedness does not mean lack of intellect, right? Just because you're not prepared, that may have something to do with the curriculum in your schools, or it may have something to do with how many students were in the class in your you know, previous educational experience. But just because you're not fully prepared does not mean you're not smart and does not mean you can't do it. Um, especially because students' perception is, I took math in high school, so I should know this. And now we're back to the, you may have, you may know it at a particular level where you recognize something, you remember it, you recognize, or where you can define, but you have trouble executing, or you can execute, but you don't know when to execute. So I think part of that, I always, and I still say this to, to colleagues, you can never be too explicit with students. And because they're young, and and ha and have you know complex psyches. Um, I think it's really important to call a spade a spade. And I think many of us, if not all of us, have at some point in our careers have students who came in underprepared, who we recognize were actually brilliant, and end up if we spend the time with them being incredible. I certainly have that had 
had that situation many, many times. They came underprepared. So A, we have to call it what it is and take the burden off of students that I'm not any good in it. The way my son said, well, I'm not good in math or writing. And that was based on looking at how good his brother was. So that was based on no data whatsoever, other than in his mind, he assumed he could never be that good. So I think first it's saying to students, just because you're underprepared, does not mean that you can't learn it. And then it's creating that kind of scaffolding to give students early successes to help them learn. I don't think there's anything wrong other than we need a new word for it, uh, the whole remediation. And maybe, I mean, I know there are lots of words in lots of different ways that students um, experience that. But um, if students come in with knowledge that's not complete or they just don't, it's or, or not accurate, we can't just move on. We can't ignore that. Sometimes we do ignore it and those students end up not being successful. But if we address it, then, um, then you know, lots of good things can happen. Um, I will say that I am a huge fan of supplemental instruction. We started it at Carnegie Mellon years ago. Um, I hired the first person in our learning center, I created the learning center and then hired this person. And it was a, a really, it was really interesting. Like many of you, we got really good students, um, but it was interesting that the B plus students came for help, right? Because those are the students who say like, well, I'm not, I'm not getting it. It's probably not my fault. Let me go and get help. But what we found with the supplemental instruction was just that one, maybe two hours a week of, of, of added time on task from the lectures or the discussions or the labs made a huge difference in addressing some of the underpreparedness. So there are programs like supplemental instruction and, I, I, and a plethora of others, which really help students outside the classroom to be able to get more help that can lead to their success. Thank you. I'm frantically messaging my math friends as you're talking because all the amazing things you've said, you need to come over here. So thank you for that. <laughs> okay. And you know what? Reach out to me. I guess I didn't put my email anywhere, but um, I'll send it to Yarek. Uh, reach out to me if you, if you want to talk or you want more information. Other comments, questions, or should I move on? I think you you're okay on. to move on. You can move on. Okay. Okay. So now let's move to practice and feedback. I love this one because I've never met a faculty member anywhere in the world who doesn't believe in practice and feedback. Every and not even faculty at college university level, but when I've interacted with, you know, K through 12 teachers, everybody knows the heart and soul of learning is practice and feedback. And believe it or not, Students of all ages know it outside of their academic life. Because when you find something that students are good at, a musical instrument, a sport, um, draw, drawing, sewing, whatever it is, if you find something students are good at, really good at, they take pride in, and you ask them, how did you get to be so good at that? They will tell you, I practiced a lot and I had really good coaches or really good teachers. They know what helps them to perform, to really learn and then be able to perform is practice and feedback. The problem is often they don't transfer that into their academic life. And I'm saying that because both as a faculty member and as an administrator, I would hear from students all the time. Why do we have to write so many papers? Why can't we write one paper in this course? Why do we have to do drafts? Why do we have to have problem sets every week? Why do we have to do the lab and then write it up, right? I mean, they just kind of didn't get that even if you understand something and you're engaged in the practice, the more you practice, the more fluent you become in it, the easier it becomes. So um, I think it's really important that we remind students um, about this, this, this concept 
And I think it's really good also to evoke what I'm just evoking here in terms of, you know, playing a sport or playing um, or playing an instrument. Now, when we go back to the whole notion of practice and feedback, I, it, again, it's really important that we have clearly stated goals, objectives, outcomes, so that our students and we share, have a shared understanding of what it is we're working with. Because the goals, the objectives, the outcomes should direct the practice they should help us evaluate the observed performance, whatever that is, and they should shape the kind of feedback that we give. And so it is this continuous cycle. And if, you, if students could understand it as a continuous cycle, um, then that would make both their learning more deeply um, available to them, and it would certainly, um, you know, get rid of a lot of the um, a lot of the complaints that that they engage in. Now, the issue when I said I've never met a faculty member or teacher who disagreed with practice and feedback being incredibly important, the issue always comes back to time. There's never enough time, given what we have to cover in our courses, to engage in enough practice. And if I'm teaching a large, if I'm teaching three courses and, you know, they're all 100 students, how do I have time to give the kind of targeted feedback that they may need? And so for me, this really does become what kind of strategies can we use around practice and feedback that are time efficient for students and for us um, that will continue to enhance their learning. And that's where really deep, uh, deeply embedded um, strategies as you're designing courses are really important. So let me give you a couple of examples here. So if any, I, so let me give you a personal example and, and then a, um, a, an academic example. So my boys were both played basketball. They were tall and um, well, not only because they were tall and fast, but you know, they were really good basketball players. What was interesting for me to watch, having grown up in a family with seven girls, um, was how they learned basketball. I would drop them off at practice. Sometimes I'd wait, sometimes I'd come back, but I always watched them practice. And then they'd come home and practice for hours in the, bas in the backyard with the basketball hoop. And um, they didn't practice everything all at once. They would have sessions where they, you know, spent hours just dribbling, 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 dribbling. And then they would be passing. And then they would have a practice where they would simply be dribbling and passing. And, um, and then they would spend time shooting. And then they would dribble, pass, and shoot. And, and so they learned the kind of discrete pieces. And then they learned how to put them all together. And the entire time they had somebody yelling at them, about watching their feet or, you know, whatever. And so um, it, it was very interesting to watch once they were feeling comfortable with those component parts, putting them together. And that's part of mastery, which, which we, we may have time to get to, but is taking those component parts and then being able to put them together. Okay, now think about this in terms of um, some of what some of you might do in your discipline. So, um, so, so say you're a statistics professor and, um, and you're teaching students a bunch of different statistical tests, um, which, you know, um, work in certain contexts. Um, you could teach students three or four or five different statistical tests and um, to the point where they can execute them. And then you give them a quiz that is not execute. It's just go through these 20 problems and just tell me what statistical text, test you would use. So that's not about execution because maybe the faculty member knows they can execute it. It's about knowing when to use what information. And so there you have it. What you're practicing there is identifying what to use in those particular, um, in those particular cases and not, doesn't take long to grade, um, but assures that you get students thinking about not every test can be used in every situation. And so thinking about how to break down what it is we're asking people to do 
the learners to do into component parts and then testing on those component parts. At some point, they're going to get an exam where they're going to have to do it all, identify it and execute it and then check their work, right? But um, they don't have to do it all at the beginning. So whatever your discipline is to think about practice in some of those component parts. And the same with targeted feedback. Um, anybody who has graded, <laughs> no matter your discipline, whether you're in a field like mine where you give lots of papers for students to write, or whether you're in a problem-based field or a design field where people are drawing things or computer science where they're coding, one thing you can be sure of is that oftentimes you'll come across an, an error, a misconception, an inaccuracy that you see over and over again in several students. Um, and so you start to be able to kind of, um, if you will, you know, keep track of that targeted feedback that you can give a group of students. So I had many colleagues for many years who, instead of writing on every single paper, just had a key, for example, you know, one through 10. And if there were ones, it meant, you know, um, um, you don't provide factual support for this argument. And if it were two, it was, you know, this is a complex sentence and I can't parse it. And if it were three, it was something else. Well, you can also do that in, you know, in any field. Um, you can look at the errors and you can, you know, either go back to the class and say, more than half of you um, X could have been five and have a conversation, or you can create a key that you could just hand out with students when you hand all of the papers or the problem sets or the design or the codes back. And so, again, thinking about how to have component practices as well as, you know, um, the integrated practice and then targeted feedback that doesn't take a lot of time, um, I think it's just incredibly important because it's all about practice and feedback. I mean, it's just so incredibly important. Um, I, I know that rubrics have come in and out of, you know, fashion um, and there are poorly designed and really good rubrics. I was, I always used rubrics, very specific rubrics when I was, um, when I handed back papers for students, I gave them the rubric up front um, and I discussed it with them up front so that as they were writing their paper, they had the expectations right there for what made a good historical argument and what made a well-written argument. And they had those up front so they could look at what it is they wrote and at least try and gauge the degree to which they met it. And then when I handed the paper back, I could hone in on particular things within that rubric. So I, I really, really loved rubrics. Um, again, in terms of this activate activation for students, I think attitude does have a lot to do with um, the the um, practices that they engage in. So I think it's really important to remind them that anything that you want to become really good at in life, you will have to practice and get feedback. And that's true in every professional field. Um, let me stop there because we're doing pretty good with time and ask if there are questions around practice and feedback. Has anyone used sort of group feedback or keys or rubrics and had success with them? Um, yes, and I also have a, a quick question for you while we're looking through the chat is um, the quality of feedback to me is also super in, important, not just the process of feedback. Yes. So how do you ensure or what are some strategies to ensure that the feedback is constructive and it motivates students to focus on that learning process rather than just getting the points to pass the class? Yeah, that's a, such a good question. Thank you. Thank you. I should have said this. The Absolutely. The quality of the feedback and the quality of the feedback should be such that students can act on it. So to say this isn't much of an argument doesn't tell me as a student how I could have presented it so that it would be. So giving feedback that is actionable, it's sort of the same way instead of saying the goal, 
uh, my, my, my objective in this course is that you will understand. Well, that's not helpful. Does understand mean describe or execute or know when to use? So you gotta use specific verbs um, so that students can know what it is they're expected to, to, to walk out of the course with. Well, that same specificity in actionable feedback is important. And, and I'm sorry, because I had even jotted down, I wanted to say this. My first course in graduate school where I didn't think I belonged at Carnegie Mellon, I went to a state university. I was the first in my family to go to college. Um, you know, imposter syndrome, syndrome to the nth degree. And my very first course in graduate school was a kind of early computer statistics course. And it was another woman and I and um, and and we had to do this big project, and you know it involved like some algorithms and some statistical stuff, and and I didn't have a lot of confidence, and so it it was like a six week project, and then we had to give this paper to um, our faculty member, and when we got it back in our student mailbox, I remember I pulled it out, and on the front of the paper it said wow, W O W with an exclamation point. And we looked through and there were a couple of other things, you know, you may you may wanna redo this or rework that. And we looked at each other and we said, wow, does that mean, wow, you two are the most brilliant graduate students ever? Or does that mean, wow, how the hell did they let you into this program? W wow, what, what the, and even when we went and looked at some of the comments, we couldn't, we couldn't define what wow meant. We talked about it for two days until we decided that we needed to go in and ask the, the professor what wow meant. Um, and I won't go into that part of the story. We stayed in graduate school, so obviously it wasn't we were the worst students and how did we get in? Um, but years later, I thought to myself, well, okay, wow got us into his office, even though it took two days. And his question was, why did it take two days? But wow was also not helpful because we couldn't figure it out. So that's not actionable. What he should have told us was a whole variety of other things, which he then in his office described to us and we got it and we understood. So the quality of feedback is important and it has to be actionable. Does that respond to your question? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, so I, it's, I, yeah, if they're going to go do it again, they know exactly what to do. Thank you, Susina, for your wonderful uh, questions and answers. Uh, I have it, uh, since we're in the topic of rubrics, and you mentioned that, uh, in what ways can assessment rubrics be designed to more effective measure the depth of students' understanding and learning rather than just their ability to, to achieve higher grades? Well, okay, that's a very, very good question. So first of all, if you, if you design a really good rubric, which outlines the knowledge and the skills and the levels of knowledge and skills that students should out of a particular you know, assignment um, or project or paper or whatever, achieve. If they achieve those, then let's face it, the grade follows. Um, and so I never, when I develop rubrics, said A, B, C, D, E, but I had columns, which is here's the minimum. And if you do this, not very good. As you move across the rubric, you move across a kind of depth of knowledge and breadth of knowledge, which in fact is going to result in an A, if you will, on the paper. So um, the same thing with, with outcomes or mastery or competency-based, if you clearly lay out what it is you expect students to know or be able to do at the end of a course, and if they engage in the behaviors to get there, great, they got an A in the course. I mean, I, I don't think grades are all bad. I think it's just that we have not defined clearly enough, explicitly enough to students what we see as top performance, as mediocre performance, and as poor performance. The grade may say this must be mediocre or poor, but we haven't created the language um, that helps students you know, move 
from poor to mediocre to great. So, um, so rubrics take a lot of time and a lot of energy um, to create. I, I will tell you, even though I thought I was very good at it, um, I always went to colleagues um, and asked for their feedback. And every time I thought I did something really, really well um, in terms of designing the rubric, and I gave it to two or three colleagues, I went back and I adjusted it, I enhanced it, I used more specific language. And the reason that happens a lot is because again, that expert blind spot. Like I thought I was hitting what it is I wanted students to be able to do in this particular project or paper, when in fact I had missed a whole bunch of steps because of that expert blind spot, because they were things that came easily to me and it's really hard to delineate those steps. So, um, so students, I mean, faculty would often say, well, if they do everything in this rubric, you know, they're going to write the paper or do the project toward the goals in that rubric. And my response would be, great, what's the problem with that? If you have defined that rubric, defined those outcomes, and students do their project with those in mind, then they're focusing on the outcomes, they're learning them, and they get a good grade. I'm worried I'm not explaining that the right way. Well, so no, no, you, you are. I just, um, often, you know, when we use rubrics, um, so often um, rubrics don't somewhat, I'm um, take that back. I think what I'm trying to get to is we need to track students' progression, right? Uh, yes. uh, this learning progression from, you know, from week to week to week, right? Whether, whatever assessment you want to use, authentic assessments, direct assessments, whatever it is. Um, it's it's kind of like Jerry mentioned in the, in the chat, you know, uh, students who do who do well <laughs> um, and using those rubrics is the expectation to uh, make sure that the, the knowledge and skills are learned or is it just to have a grade well here's the students, thing about students, it. Care, students care about grades right they do they do. They're much, they care more about grades often exactly. not always, than they do about, yeah, than they do about the learning. But what I'm saying is, wouldn't it be beautiful if both of those coexisted? So if my rubric is so good and students teach, uh, learn to the rubric, do design to the rubric, write the paper to the rubric, then they're going to get an A. I don't care about the A. They care about it more than I do. Mm -hmm. I care about the fact that they have actually learned everything I wanted to. I wanted them to learn. So you know, teach to the rubric. They learn to the rubric. They perform. They get a good grade. I mean, isn't that what it's all about? So my concern about rubrics is I think most of them aren't designed very well. But I think if you have a well-designed rubric that really, you know, has very explicit outcomes for the project or the paper at different levels, and they meet all of that, great, they get the grade. So I don't, I don't get hung up on that because I don't feel like, okay, let me give you another example. Um, you know, for a while, there, was, there were these concerns around teachers teaching to a test whether it's in secondary ed or whether it's, uh, you know, the, the test you have to take to become a, a licensed architect or a nurse or whatever, you know, this concern about teaching to the test. Um, and it was, it was as if it was a bad thing. But if you are teaching students so that they can learn something and then they're, they're able through an assessment to show that learning, what's wrong with teaching to the test? What it is, is you've made whatever they're being assessed on the outcomes that you want. So now they've achieved those outcomes. That's great. So that notion of teaching to the test in my mind isn't a bad thing, unless the teaching to the test is at a superficial level, then it is a bad thing because learning in order to be able to use it fluently and flexibly in new contexts means that you have to have a deep understanding. So I think sometimes the teaching to the test was kind of rote memorization. And I think that was the concern that people had. 
Thank you. There's uh, one question that we skipped that was a little bit higher up. Um, so I just wanna make sure and ask it. It can be frustrating to spend time giving feedback to students, even when it's actionable and then have them not use it or take it in. That's often because they need to learn what feedback is and how to use it. Can you share some ideas on how to do this? So I think motivating, encouraging students to, to utilize that feedback, even if it's actionable. That is such a good question. And it's often difficult to do depending on, uh, so I do have some, some, some strategies, but it's often hard to do depending on the pace of your course and the kinds of assessments that you have. But, um, but for example, um, we, a colleague of mine created at Carnegie Mellon, Marsha Lovett, these wraparounds that we used to um, help um, faculty use in their courses so that when students got an exam back, they had to look at the exam and they had a few questions they had to answer about why they made the mistake they made or what they would do differently. So that, and, and, then the, and then the faculty would collect those. So it accomplished two things. One, it helps students to actually reflect on the feedback because often they glance at it and then they put it aside because they're already working on another problem set, another design, another paper in this course or other courses. So they don't take in the feedback and, and chew on it and really understand it. So you can do wraparounds um, where you actually give students back the exam or the paper, and then you ask them to write something very briefly about where they went wrong and most importantly, what they would do different the next time. Now, if your feedback was quality feedback and actionable, they should be able to tell you what they would do different next time. Um, so, and those are, I use those with my papers and they're pretty quick to go through. I mean, the students who really struggled sometimes even with the direct feedback still struggled. So the good news is you can pull them out and have a conversation with them because you know that even if you've given quality feedback, for some reason, there's a block, they're just not processing it. Um, so, so that helps um, students to do, to, 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 you know, to be able to use the feedback. I always did drafts when I did papers and um, yes, it was rigorous and students would complain instead of writing a paper, they did three drafts. And um, I would always say to them, you do problem sets every week in your in your math oriented, science oriented classes. So, you know, why can't you engage a little more, be, you know, in doing this? And what they found inevitably after the first set of papers was that they ended up doing much better, okay, based on grade, but because they took the feedback from uh, what I provided, and they use that feedback as they did the second draft and then the third draft. So they could actually look and see with feedback, the paper got better. When the classes got to be too many or got to be um, too large, I used peer feedback. And just like rubrics, if you create a peer feedback instrument where students can read each other's paper and respond, Believe it or not, they can do it even at the freshman level. I have years of exper experience in this. Even at the freshman level, if you create a, a list of attributes for the paper and you ask students to comment on their colleagues' paper with those attributes, most of them can do it. So I became a big fan of peer feedback, which took a lot less time um, from me and resulted in really good um, iterations of the paper. So, so the, um, yes. I, I have a specific um, concern. I teach a conversation class um, for adult learners and I use many different things, including text. I would like to use current events, but it's so, the major things are so controversial. I'd like to give them a chance to talk about it, but they're so controversial, I'm afraid to bring them up in class. Uh, is your conversation yes. class non-native speakers? Yes, yes, yeah. obvious, yes. Yeah, yeah. But um, I, I want to give them the opportunity because that's what people talk about. Yeah. Um, 
Wow. <laughs> I don't know how to respond to that just because I, that's a whole nother conversation. Um, and I, I, you know, we don't have time to go into it, except that, that I'll make a couple of comments. One, um, we, we do live in such a highly po politicized and divisive environment in our country right now that um, I know has seeped into many classrooms across the country, which is just to me so incredibly sad because I really think it does get in the way of learning. And in my philosophy is that, you know, in college um, and at universities, at, even in K through 12, but at college and universities, it's an opportunity to perspectives. And it's really hard now in the politicized and divisive environment in which we live. It becomes even more difficult when you're dealing with non-native speakers, as you know, because you have people coming from all different contexts who live in very different, um, who, who grew up in very different experiences. And so um, I think that makes it even more difficult. I, I don't, I don't have an answer for it. I can commiserate with it. Um, my daughter-in-law is Turkish and I love her dearly. And, um, you know, she grew up and right now the, many people believe Turkey is in a dictatorship under Erdogan. And, you know, and so when she was growing up and her family is still there, she has this very specific way of viewing the world that when we talk about U.S. politics is like you know, compared to the things that we have to deal with in Turkey, this is nothing. Um, so I, I don't know what the answer to that is, given what's going on in the world today. Um, and other than, you know, there are more divisive and less divisive things going on in the world. And so can you choose some of the less divisive, which <laughs> may have to do with, and, and who knows in this day and age, what's less divisive? you know, damming up a river out west so that, you know, the, the river stops and the people who've always gotten the water downstream aren't getting it anymore because water is, you know, a, a commodity now. I don't know, is that less divisive than what's going on in the Supreme Court? I, you know, it's so hard to describe or define what less divisive is now that, first of all, you're doing really important work. And second, I just, I don't know. I, I don't know how to deal with that. I, I, I think, Susan, that the, the, the point here would be, again, going back to your discussion about skill and competency, right? We, you know, whatever the issue is, we, we still need to teach our students how to deal with it without resorting to necessarily, you know, negative <laughs> behavior, so to speak. So I, I, I think that's that's what it needs to be, that, you know, regardless of what the, what the topic is, I, I couldn't agree more with you. We, we don't have to be, you know pulling out the pitchforks every time we talk about, you know, uh, uh, soccer teams, you know, from, from different countries. I mean, that, 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 you know, not, not that that hasn't happened, but that's, that's probably, that's probably it, that, that you, you stay away from the divisive issues. And, and if you have to, you tackle them with, with a uh, um, great degree of, of, of respect, first of all, for, for, for different types of view. And, and I think that more, more importantly than anything, it's, it's this again, understanding of the issue is the beginning but how you handle it is, is is ultimately that's 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 uh the the outcome of it and and we just don't do enough of that it's 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 kind of like you know yeah let's let's not talk about it let's 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 uh you know sweep it under the rug kind of a thing but the world is out there i again i i, I agree with you 100 percent. there's there's just so much that's that's going on and and our students do need to be be prepared to 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 tackle this you know i i I heard the voices that, you know, those, those people who attacked the, you know, Capitol Hill, you know, we had one thing in common, right? Regardless of the political spectrum, we all have gone through some degree of education, you know, right. and 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 what 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 just happened, you know, how can we possibly have gone so wrong? So so uh there we go. It's it's a very, very complex issue. So thank you, Joyce, for bringing this up. It's 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 something that that you know, one of those equity discussions, you know, needs needs to be going there. Yeah. And again, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just glad that that you know this this could be a forum. Who knows? Maybe we should have one of those Friday SLO talks. You know, how do you handle dangerous yeah. topics in the classroom? You know. Yeah, yeah, and I appreciate your comment because you know you're right about maybe if we spent more time helping our learners, whether they're adults or or younger students, learn to be respectful listeners 
because a lot of people believe that that's part of the problem, that we don't listen enough, deeply enough, and we don't listen respectfully so that, you know, you can, um, you can work with disagreement or people who believe different, people who believe differently from you in a civil way. Um, so yes, it's an opportunity to do it. Um, and I think in some respects, you know, we should all share that no matter what discipline we're in, but it's got to be done very carefully in this day and age. I, I think that's the, you know, and, you know, in fact, um, um, I'm not going to, we're not going to get to this student development and climate that leads to learning, but I simply want to say that, that the level depending on, and by student, I sh it should say learner, because it can be learners across. It could be graduate students, it could be the adult non-native speakers, and it can be freshmen. But, but we all continue to grow and develop as we go through life. And where we are developmentally interacts with the climate, and that can either enhance learning or it can hinder learning. And so, um, you know, where students are, in their development, where learners are in their developmental journey um, can really, uh, you know, make it easy to have a civil, respectful conversation or not. And so, you know, it, I, I see what's going on in classrooms across the country. I continue to have enormous respect for all of you, for all of my colleagues out there in the world. And in some respects, it's a cop out, but I'm happy I retired when I did because it's very hard to teach history at this point in time because of the divisiveness. Okay, um, I think that um, what I would like to do with the time we have left. Um, so we've talked a little about mastery. I'm, I'm not gonna spend any more time on it right now, but it really was that notion. And, and this really should read um, knowledge and skills, but have, acquiring the component parts and then, you know, integrating them and knowing when to apply them. So I've said that several times during the conversation. Um, the one thing I will introduce you to in terms of that before I go to the one principle I hope we have time for is this um, graphic, which I found back in 2000, which I love. And it was not around, it's, it was not developed for the way that I'm using it, but I absolutely love it because it really encapsulates the learning process that when you come to, to, um, uh, to any new learning experience with no background at all, you come in at a state of unconscious incompetence. And what that means is you don't know what you don't know. So if you've never taken a um, anthropology course before, a public policy course, electromagnetics, I mean, whatever, if you have no idea, then you can't even ask a question because you don't know what you don't know. And we all start there when we're learning something new. When the, the giant leap we make, and again, this could be an adult learning how to play the piano. The giant leap we make is this to the state of conscious incompetence where, okay, now I know what I don't know and now I can ask questions. And then you eventually move to a state of conscious competence where you can do things. It takes a lot of effort, time and energy and we hope that by the time we graduate our students, they're at this level of conscious competence, that it takes, you know, time, effort and energy, but they can, you know, they can create a design, they can code, they can design legislation, whatever it is. And then the state of unconscious competence is the state of full mastery or expertise that you're unconsciously competent. You don't think about a lot of what you do because you've done it for you know more than 10 years or more than 10,000 hours. And so to me, what's interesting is that at both ends of the spectrum, you're unconscious for different reasons. One is because you don't have any competence and the other is because you have way, way too much, if you will, competence. And so I always think it's important to think about the learner as you're thinking about mastery on these levels of gaining both 
competence, but a consciousness about what it is they know and what it is they don't know. All right, I'm I'm going to go to the last principle because um, I think this, this addresses some of the other things we talked about, particularly around practice and feedback, but also around prior knowledge and, and motivation. Um, and that's that if we want students to become self-directed learners, then we have to teach them how to become self-directed learners, which leads to this question of what is a self-directed learner? You are all self-directed learners and you all engage in this process that I'm going to talk about without consciously being aware of it. So you get a new task or you want to learn something new. Um, you first sit down and you assess the task. What is it that I'm being asked to do? And without realizing it, you, you often, if there are component parts to it, well, I have to do X. And in order to do X, I'm going to have to do A, B, and C. And then you evaluate your own strength and weakness. If I have to do A, B, and C, I know A and B, I don't know how to do C. I either have to learn how to do C, or I have to ask someone or pull someone in to do C so that I can accomplish you know, the X. So you evaluate your strengths and weaknesses. You know what you know, and you know what you don't know. And then you plan what it is that you are going to do, how you're going to learn what you need to learn, how you're going to engage in the project, whatever. And then as you move into the actual doing, you're continually monitoring your performance. So you're stepping back every so often and saying, here was the task, here's what I needed to do, here are the, here's the final goal that I need to reach. Am I moving toward that or did I, you know, did I go off route? And then most importantly, once you're done, you reflect. So you reflect and you adjust as you're going through it. But once you're done, you reflect. And here's the example I always use. I, and I wish we could do a show of hands because I know what would happen. Anyone who's ever written an article or a book, anyone who's ever you know, designed something anyone who's ever written code, what, whatever, especially as an expert, as soon as you hit the button to send it to the client or send it to the, to the um, publisher or whatever, as soon as you hit that, you go, oh, I should have added this. I should have done this. What would have happened if I did this? Why didn't I include that? I should have had another few references. You're reflecting um, on what it is you've just done. And you can be sure that when a student hands in that paper, that design, that problem set, they hand it in and they wait for you to grade it and get it back. They don't, they don't sit down and go, oh my gosh, what, what, what would, should I have done this? Could I have done that? Most of them early on in the learning process. Now that changes as they go through graduate school and or if they're adult returning professionals and they've had life experience and work experience, then usually they engage in this task. Uh, I mean, in this process, but early on, uh, students don't. And so this notion of we need to teach them how to do it is exactly that. So you may, you may yourself do this or have colleagues who do it. You hand out an assignment and then you ask students in their own word to tell you what the assignment is about. And early on in the first couple of years, if you do this, you can be really surprised at what they think the assignment is. But you can ask them. You can say, I want everybody to just send me one line in email in your own words to tell me what that's about. You can also say to students, I want you to tell me where you feel confident and not confident. And in the area not confident, what are you going to do about it? So, you know, you actually have them engage in that as part of the process of whatever it is they're doing. And then at the end, you say, when you're done, right before you hand it in, I want you to tell me what would you do differently? So giving them an opportunity to kind of practice this is really important because left to their own devices, younger students don't engage in these metacognitive skills. Um, but the good news is that often, you know, older students or more mature students will do that. So I think it's incredibly important 
given what's going on in the world. We know students going out into the world today are gonna to have a series of jobs and the jobs may be really different. We know that they're gonna get into jobs where they're gonna to need to upskill because the world is changing so quickly. And a lot of that upskilling or increasing their knowledge base is gonna be either on their own or they're gonna to have to engage in educational experiences, you know, online or otherwise. And so if, it be, if it's more important than ever that our students be able to continue to learn throughout their professional lives, then they really need to understand what it takes to learn. And the really good learners just do it without reflecting on it. And that might serve them well in college, but when they get out in the world, it may not serve them so well unless they become a little more, a little more cognizant of that process. So I really wanted to get that out there because this is one of those meta skills that we should all be working toward so that our students can continue to be successful when they leave us. And I don't think we talk enough about it. And I don't think we engage in the actions that we should to get students to engage in those behaviors. So I'm gonna stop there for comments, questions, experiences before we wrap up. We had a question much earlier, and I don't know if Sierra, if you wanted to ask it out loud, um, but now I'm scrolling back up, I apologize, I should have ready, but it was, um, faculty are beginning to use generative AI to create rubrics. So backing up a little bit on the rubric conversation, given the amount of workload faculty have currently, do you think this is an acceptable way to save time? And then the question, what about design? Um, Sure, it's an acceptable way to save time. I'm all for it, as long as it results in what it is you need it to result in. Um, and, you know, um, I have not seen AI generated uh, rubrics, but I can believe knowing how AI works, I can believe that AI, in fact, um, may be able to generate better rubrics than we can because AI doesn't get hung up in the expert blind spot. So um, I would just wanna make sure by checking with colleagues, if you do an AI generated rubric, that it really is hitting what it is you want it to hit. Um, and I didn't understand the design part. Um, I, I don't know if it's just about um, design. I'll let Sierra chime in and clarify. Um, uh, the part of the question. And while she's doing that, um, just a logistics question I wanted to make sure and not run out of time. Lots of questions about having access to your PowerPoint slides. And then also I know there's probably plenty of people like myself who have taken screenshots of them, of the graphics, because they're fantastic. Oh, you, you can, I will, I will send, yes. I, I mean, first of all, there is a book and there is actually, I didn't fully participate in this new one, but um, I, the old book is fine. It's not that different, but there is a book and the graphics are there, but I will send Jarek these, um, these um, slides and you are welcome to, to use them. I'm sorry, I should have said that up front so you could all focus and not have to worry about taking screenshots. No, no worries. I'm just big on making sure that the, the intention of the authors is, is very clear. So um, I just want to make you sure. Know, get that. And here's, here's the other thing I, I, I want to say, um, because again, it hits several of these, um, it, it hits several of the principles, but this notion of us as faculty, as teachers, modeling the behaviors or or sharing with students our experience as learners, I think is incredibly important. And, um, and in one of the last courses that I taught, students were struggling with a very difficult concept paper. And instead of having them do three, I had them do four um, iterations of the paper, four drafts. And they were very unhappy about that. It was a busy semester and they were very unhappy about that. And, um, and as I was going to class that day where I, where I you know, was gonna have to hear some of the complaining about time and, and, and students are busy and I get it, I'm not, I'm not dissing that at all. But um, I was walking by, I had just submitted an article and I was walking by um, my credenza in which I had a stack of, um, of drafts 
And I always did better and I still do editing on paper and then getting in and, and making the edits. And so I would print out each one. And I had a stack of, it had to be at least 50 or 60 um, of those, you know, through the editing. And so I picked up the stack and I brought it to class with me. And um, I laid it down and I said to students, great news, I just submitted an article that I was really struggling with for a while. And they, they all said, oh, great, wonderful, you know. And then I picked it up and I said, and this is how many drafts I had to do to get it to where I felt confident that it made a contribution. And I am not kidding you when students were shocked, absolutely shocked. And when I said, how do you think people like me write? They said, well, at this point, we just thought you just sit down and write and it's done. Like, are you kidding? They were so surprised that even later in one's career, you still go through iterations and, you know, and, um, you, and, and adjustments and you're monitoring and they were just shocked. So I think it's really important to sometimes share with students how we weren't always perfect and we're still not, and we still struggle with a lot of things. I, I, just, I just think that's part of being explicit and giving them hope and motivating them. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, um, we're gonna wrap up and then we'll I'll have five minutes left for questions. But um, so there's a lot more information on all of these if you want in the book. And at the end of each chapter, there are a whole bunch of strategies. So I think that's very valuable. I also have found, and it's part of the reason why I always loved doing workshops where, um, where our colleagues got to share, because what I found over the years is that I learned a lot from colleagues in, in, in really far off disciplines from my own and adapted strategies that they were using for myself. And so I always think when you've got a group of smart people together, um, you can, you know, you can come up with strategies that intersect these principles that can be happy. I mean, that can be helpful um, and make you happy. But so I just want to remind you that, you know, I started by saying that learning happens in the mind of the learner and only in the mind of the learner. But the good news is that we all possess the power to create the conditions that can help students to learn. So to really understand them as cognitive, social, emotional beings, and to design in a way that enhances the learning process, then is, you know, is our contribution to learning. And I started by also saying, I always said this to the students, whether I was teaching a freshman seminar or a graduate course, that we're in this together, but the truth of the matter is the onus is on you as a learner. I can create the most brilliant course with amazing examples and creative projects, and I can give you really beautiful targeted feedback. But if you don't engage as a learner, then none of what I did is gonna be helpful at all. And I think that they need to understand that the onus is on them and we design the environment and we provide the support, the scaffolding they need, but in the end, it's gotta be them because learning happens in the mind of the learner. Final comments, questions, examples, concerns, and this is a, a big topic, um, but it came up in the Padlet, so I'll, I'll let your ability, amazing ability to succinctly answer it. But um, the question is, how to convince instructors of the value of using evidence-based practices? Some faculty members value more their experience than what research says. Yeah, oh my God, that's a great question. That is such a great question. So I, I, I want to start with that. With, with saying, I, I mean, I battled this when I worked at Carnegie Mellon and was running the, the Everly Center for Teaching. Um, so the first thing is your students are not you. Most of your students will never be teaching at the college or university level. They won't go on to get masters and PhDs. So um, if you are going to recreate for your students what is done for you, you were learning um, in a very particular context at a very particular time in your life and the world. 
and you are a very particular kind of person. So your students' life experience, educational experience, motivation, it's totally, totally different from your own. And that's why much of what you may be trying to do based on this is what was helpful for me doesn't work. Um, and, you know, one of the things I find really interesting is some of the smartest people around are us, the faculty, and, um, and yet, <laughs> you know, we would not engage in, in, in writing research papers or giving seminars or whatever, unless we were sure that the practices that we used to come up with the results were, were solid, were sound, were acceptable. And yet when it comes to our teaching, we, you know, we don't engage in what the research tells us will work to help our students. So there just to me is this kind of disconnect. Um, but I think the most important thing we say to our colleagues is our students are not us. And as a result of that, they may not have the same motivations we have. They may not see the value the way we did. Um, and, you know, many students today are working as well as going to school. And many of us didn't need to do that. I mean, I worked, but many of my my um, peers when I was at college didn't need to work. They came from families where they you know, were afforded that luxury. Um, so students' lives are really complicated now. And, and that's, I mean, it's, I make that plea all the time that if there's one, if there's one thing that, that you do, it's to understand that our students are not us and you can't assume that they are. Thank you, whoever uh, brought that up. I just, that's incredibly important.